Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Troy McKenzie. I'm the dean of NYU School of Law, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here for this event. Uh, let me begin with uh, some words of thanks. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Jennifer Arlen with our program on corporate compliance and enforcement, Professor Rob Jackson and Professor Ed Rock with our Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance, and also to Professors Steve Troy and David Yermak with our Pollock Center for Law and Business. Um, all of them have been instrumental in planning tonight's event. This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, Lisa Monaco. Uh, she is a veteran of the Department of Justice. She has served as a career federal prosecutor and in several important leadership roles throughout the department. Uh, she began her DOJ career as counsel to Attorney General Janet Reno. She then went on to serve in a number of positions, including as an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, where she was a member of the Enron Task Force, and where she received the Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service, the department's highest award. She also served as chief of staff at the FBI to then director Bob Mueller, principal associate deputy attorney general, and assistant attorney general for national security. In that role, she was the first woman to hold the position. And from 2013 to 2017, she served as the Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor under President Barack Obama, where she advised on all aspects of counterterrorism policy and strategy. And um, as you can see, she has had uh, deep experience throughout the uh, DOJ and elsewhere in the executive branch. Uh, when she left the Obama administration, she joined CNN as a commentator. She also worked at uh, an international law firm. Uh, for us here at NYU, she was also a presence in our hallways as um, a distinguished senior fellow with the Reese Center on Law and Security. So we are welcoming her back uh, to this building today. Uh, two final notes before I turn the microphone over to uh, Deputy Attorney General Monaco. Um, it is a privilege to have her here today. She is going to deliver remarks on changes the Department of Justice will be making to its corporate criminal enforcement policies. And importantly, following her speech, she has very kindly agreed to take questions. Uh, we will take questions from uh, the non-press members of the audience, and if you uh, do have a question, uh, a faculty member will call on you and will direct the questioning. And you can uh, ask your question at a microphone that will be provided. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to uh, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. <clears throat> Dean McKenzie, and let me just say, it is great to be back at NYU. It's great to be out of Washington, um, so, but it's particularly great to be back uh, at NYU. Thank you, Dean, for that uh, very warm introduction and for hosting uh, all of us here today. I am, as I said, very, very happy to be back here and to see so many friends and former colleagues uh, here in the audience. Let me start, though, by acknowledging some of my current colleagues who are here. That includes, of course, the U.S. attorneys for the Southern and Eastern Districts of New York uh, and uh, New Jersey. The U.S. attorney for uh, New Jersey is also here. Uh, very happy uh, to see uh, you all in the audience. Um, but I also want to pay special attention uh, and it is just as important, I think, that we're joined both here and on the live stream uh, by line prosecutors, by agents, by investigative analysts, the career men and women who do the hard work, 
day in and day out to make great cases and to hold wrongdoers accountable. I also want to recognize our federal and state partners who play an incredibly uh, critical role in corporate enforcement. And of course, let me also thank the Institute for Corporate Governance and Finance and the Pollock Center, um, and of course, Professor Jennifer Arlen and the NYU Program on Corporate Compliance and Enforcement for uh, doing everything to make this event possible, and frankly, for serving as a bridge between the worlds of policymaking and academia. Now, addressing corporate crime is far from a new subject for the Justice Department. In fact, in the aftermath of Watergate, Attorney General Edward Levy was tasked not only with restoring the Department of Justice's institutional credibility, but also with rebuilding its corporate enforcement program. In a 1975 speech, he told prosecutors that there was great demand to be more aggressive against what was then termed white-collared crime. <laughs> now, he explained his distaste for the term, a distaste you can tell I share because you won't hear me say white-collar crime. I'll talk about corporate criminal enforcement. He explained his distaste for that term, saying that it suggested a distinction in law enforcement based upon social class. Nevertheless, he acknowledged that it was an area that needed to be given greater emphasis in his words. And those are words that are as true today as they were then. But Attorney General Levy also said that efforts to fight corporate crime at the time were hampered by a lack of resources, specially trained investigators and other issues. So he answered these complaints as all great attorneys general do. He said, his deputy attorney general would take care of it. <laughs> so for uh, the last half century almost, there has, it has been the responsibility of my predecessors to set corporate enforcement policy for the Department of Justice. And I'm proud to follow in those footsteps. Now last October, I announced immediate steps that the Justice Department would take to tackle corporate crime. I also at the time formed the Corporate Crime Advisory Group, a group of Department of Justice experts tasked with a top to bottom review of our corporate enforcement efforts. To get a wide range of perspectives though, we met with a broad group of outside experts, including public interest groups, ethicists, academics, audit committee members, in-house attorneys, former corporate monitors, and members of the business community and the defense bar. And I'm very happy and pleased to see a number of the folks that we consulted with along the way here today, and I wanna thank them again uh, for their willingness to engage uh, and I think improve our efforts. Our meetings and our discussions sparked uh, a lot of talk, a lot of discussions on individual accountability and corporate responsibility on predictability and transparency, and on the ways corporate enforcement policies must square with the realities of the modern economy. And every meeting and discussion resulted in some idea or insight that frankly helped our work, and so that we, we sought to incorporate that into our work. And today you'll hear how our policies are reflecting this diverse input. Let me now turn to the substance and the changes that the department is implementing to further strengthen how we prioritize and prosecute corporate crime. First, I will reiterate that the department's number one priority is individual accountability, something the Attorney General and I have made clear since we came back into government. Whether wrongdoers are on the training floor or in the C-suite, we will hold those who break the law accountable regardless of their position, their status, or their seniority. Second, I'll discuss our approach to companies with a history of misconduct. 
I previously announced that prosecutors must consider the full range of a company's prior misconduct when determining an appropriate resolution. Today, I will outline additional guidance for evaluating corporate recidivism. Third, I'll highlight new department policy on voluntary self-disclosures, including the concrete and positive consequences that will flow from self-disclosure. We expect good companies to step up and own up to misconduct. We expect good companies to do that. Voluntary self-disclosure is an indicator of a working compliance program and, I think, a healthy corporate culture. Those companies who own up will be appropriately rewarded in the department's approach to corporate crime. Fourth, I'll detail when compliance uh, monitors are appropriate and how we can select them equitably and transparently. Today, I am also directing department prosecutors to monitor those monitors to ensure they remain on the job, on task, and on budget. Finally, I'll discuss how the department will encourage companies to shape financial compensation around promoting compliance and avoiding improperly risky behavior. These steps include rewarding companies that claw back compensation from employees, managers, and executives when misconduct happens. No one should have a financial interest to look the other way or to ignore red flags. Corporate wrongdoers, rather than shareholders, should bear the consequences of misconduct. Taken together, these policies that we are announcing today make clear that we will not accept business as usual. With a combination of carrots and sticks, with a mix of incentives and deterrence, we are giving general counsels and chief compliance officers the tools they need to make a business case for responsible corporate behavior. In short, we're empowering companies to do the right thing. And we're empowering our prosecutors to hold those accountable who don't. Now, let me start with our top priority, going after individuals who commit and profit from corporate crime. In the last year, the Department of Justice has secured notable trial victories, including convictions of the founder and chief operating officer of Theranos, convictions of J.P. Morgan traders for commodities manipulation, the conviction of a managing director of Goldman Sachs for bribery, and the first ever conviction of a pharmaceutical CEO for unlawful distribution of a controlled substance. Now, despite these steps forward, we cannot ignore the data that shows an overall decline in corporate criminal prosecutions over the last decade. <clears throat> so we need to do more, and frankly, we need to move faster. So starting today, we will take steps to empower our prosecutors to clear impediments in their way and to expedite our investigations into individuals. To do that, we will require cooperating companies to come, for, to come forward with important evidence more quickly. Now, sometimes we see companies and counsel elect for strategic reasons to delay the disclosure of critical documents or information while they consider how to mitigate the damage or to investigate on their own. Well, delayed disclosures undermine our efforts to hold individuals accountable. It limits the department's ability to pursue proactively leads and to preserve evidence before it disappears. As time goes on, the lapse of statutes of limitations, the dissipation of evidence, and the fading of memories can all undermine a successful prosecution. In individual prosecutions, speed is of the essence. So going forward, undue or intentional delay in producing information or documents, particularly those that show individual culpability, will result in the reduction or denial of cooperation credit. 
gamesmanship with disclosures and productions will not be tolerated. If a, cooper if a cooperating company discovers hot documents or evidence, its first reaction should be to come forward and bring it to the prosecutors. This requirement is in addition to the prior guidance that uh, corporations must provide all relevant non-privileged facts about individual misconduct to receive any cooperation credit. Separately, department prosecutors will work to complete investigations and seek warranted criminal charges against individuals prior to or at the same time as entering a resolution against a corporation. Sometimes, of course, the back and forth of resolving with a company can bog down individual prosecutions because after all, our prosecutors do have finite resources. Where it makes sense, though, to resolve a corporate case first, there must be a full investigative plan outlining the remaining work on the individual case and a timeline for completing that work. Collectively, this new guidance should push prosecutors and corporate counsel alike to feel like they are on the clock to expedite investigations, particularly against corporate uh, culpable individuals. Now, while many companies and prosecutors follow these principles already, this guidance sets new expectations about the sequencing of investigations and clarifies the department's priorities. Now, it is safe to say that no issue garnered more commentary or uh, discussions uh, than those that were generated from the commitment we made last year to consider the full criminal, civil, and regulatory record of any company when deciding an appropriate resolution. That decision, though, was driven by the fact that between 10 and 20 percent of large corporate criminal resolutions have involved repeat offenders. Now, we received many recommendations about how to contextualize historical misconduct, to develop a full and fair picture of misconduct and the corporate culture that's under review. We heard about the need to evaluate the regulatory environment that companies operate in, as well as the need to consider the age of the misconduct and subsequent reforms to a company's compliance culture. In response to that feedback, today we are releasing additional guidance about how such histories will be evaluated. Now, let me emphasize a few points. First, not all instances of misconduct, prior misconduct, are created equal. For these purposes, the most significant types of prior misconduct will be criminal resolutions here in the United States, as well as prior wrongdoing involving the same personnel or management as the current misconduct. But past actions may not always reflect a company's current culture and commitment to compliance. So dated conduct will generally be accorded less weight. So what do we mean by dated? Criminal resolutions, that occurred more than 10 years before the conduct currently under investigation and civil or regulatory resolutions that took place more than five years before the current conduct. Now we will also consider the nature and circumstances of the prior misconduct, including whether it shared the same root causes as the present misconduct. Some facts might indicate broader weaknesses in the compliance culture or practices such as wrongdoing that occurred under the same management or executive leadership. And other facts might provide important mitigating context. For example, if a corporation operates in a highly regulated industry, its history should be compared to others who are similarly situated to see whether or not that company is an outlier. Separately, we do not want to discourage acquisitions that result in reformed and improved compliance structures. We will not treat as recidivists companies with a proven track record of compliance that acquire companies with a history of compliance problems so long as those problems are promptly and properly addressed post-acquisition. 
Finally, I want to be clear. This department will disfavor multiple successive non-prosecution or deferred prosecution agreements with the same company. Before a prosecution team extends an offer for a successive NPA or DPA, department leadership will scrutinize that proposal. That will ensure greater consistency across the department and a more holistic approach to corporate recidivism. Companies cannot assume that they are entitled to an NPA or a DPA, particularly when they are frequent flyers. We will not shy away from bringing charges or requiring guilty pleas where facts and circumstances require. If any corporation still thinks criminal resolutions can be priced in to the cost of doing business, we have a message. Times have changed. That said, the clearest path for a company to avoid a guilty plea or an indictment is voluntary self-disclosure. The department is committed to providing incentives to companies that voluntarily self-disclose misconduct to the government. In many cases, voluntary self-disclosure is a sign that the company has developed a compliance program and has fostered a culture to detect misconduct and to bring it forward. Our goal is simple, to reward those companies whose historical investments in compliance enable voluntary self-disclosure and to incentivize other companies to make the same investments going forward. Voluntary self-disclosure programs in various parts of the department have already been successful. Take, for example, the Antitrust Division's leniency program, the Criminal Division's voluntary disclosure program for FCPA violations, and the National Security Division's program for export control and sanctions violations. We want to expand those types of policies department-wide. We also want to clarify the benefits of promptly coming forward to self-report so that chief compliance officers, general counsels, and others can make the case in the boardroom that voluntary self-disclosure is frankly a good business decision. So for the first time, every Department of Justice component that prosecutes corporate crime will now have a program that incentivizes voluntary disclosure. If a component currently lacks a formal documented policy, it must now draft one. Predictability is critical. These policies must provide clear expectations of what self-disclosure entails, and they must identify the concrete benefits that a self-disclosing company can expect. So I am also announcing common principles that will apply across these voluntary self-disclosure policies. Absent aggravating factors, the department will not seek a guilty plea from a company that has voluntarily self-disclosed, cooperated, and remediated. In addition, the department will not require an independent compliance monitor for such a corp uh, corporation if, at the time of the resolution, it also has implemented and tested an effective compliance program. Simply put, the math here is easy. Voluntary self-disclosure can save a company hundreds of millions of dollars in fines, in penalties, and costs. It can avoid reputational harms that arise from pleading guilty. And it can reduce the risk of collateral consequences like suspension and debarment in relevant industries. And if you look at our recent cases, you can see the value proposition that I'm talking about. Voluntary self-disclosure cases have resulted in declinations and in non-prosecution agreements with no significant criminal penalties. By contrast, recent cases that did not involve self-disclosure have resulted in guilty pleas and in billions of dollars in criminal penalties. And that has happened this year alone. Now, I expect that resolutions over the next few months will reaffirm just how much better companies fare when they come forward and they self-disclose. Let me now turn to the issue of monitors. 
Over the past year of the discussions that we've had, we heard a call for more transparency to reduce suspicion and frankly confusion about monitors. And today we're addressing some of those concerns. First, we are releasing new guidance for prosecutors about how to identify the need for a monitor, how to select a monitor, and how to oversee that monitor's work to increase the likelihood of its success. Second, going forward, all monitor selections will be made pursuant to a documented selection process that operates transparently and consistently. And department prosecutors will ensure that the scope of every monitorship is tailored to the misconduct and related compliance deficiencies of the resolving company. They will receive regular updates to verify that the monitor stays on task and on budget. Now, let me be clear. We at the Department of Justice are not regulators, nor do we aspire to be. But where we impose a monitor, we also have an obligation to stay involved and to monitor that monitor. Now, as everyone here knows, all of this comes back to a corporate compliance culture. Having served when I was out of government as both outside counsel and as a corporate board member, I know the difficult decisions and trade-offs that companies face the difficult decisions about how to invest corporate resources, how to structure compliance programs, and how to foster the right corporate culture. In our discussions leading up uh, to these announcements, we identified, though, encouraging trends and new ways in which compliance departments are being strengthened and sharpened. But resourcing a compliance department, frankly, is not enough it must also be backed by and integrated into a corporate culture that rejects wrongdoing for the sake of profit. And companies can foster that culture through their leadership and through the choices that they make. To promote that culture, an increasing number of companies are choosing to reflect corporate values in their compensation systems. On the deterrent side, these companies employ clawback provisions, the escrowing of compensation, and other ways to hold financially accountable individuals who contribute to criminal misconduct. Compensation systems that clearly and effectively impose financial penalties for misconduct can deter risky behavior and foster a culture of compliance. And on the incentive side, Companies are building compensation systems that use affirmative metrics and benchmarks to reward compliance promoting behavior. Going forward, when prosecutors evaluate the strength of a company's compliance program, they will consider whether its compensation system rewards compliance and imposes financial sanctions on employees, executives, or directors whose direct or supervisory actions or omissions contributed to criminal misconduct. They will evaluate what companies say and what companies do, including whether after learning of misconduct, a company actually claws back compensation or otherwise, is, otherwise imposes financial penalties. And so I have asked the criminal division to develop further guidance by the end of this year on how to reward corporations that employ clawback or similar arrangements. This will include how to shift the burden of corporate financial penalties away from shareholders who frequently play no role in misconduct onto those who are more directly responsible. But we're not done. We will continue to engage and protect victims, workers, consumers, investors, and others. We will continue to find ways to improve our approach, such as by enhancing the effectiveness of the federal government's system of debarment and suspension. We will continue to seek targeted resources for corporate criminal enforcement, including the $250 million we are requesting from Congress for corporate crime initiatives next year. Today's announcements are fundamentally about individual accountability and corporate responsibility, but they're also about ownership and choice. 
Companies should feel empowered to do the right thing, to invest in compliance and culture, and to step up and own up when misconduct happens. Companies that do so will welcome the announcements I've made today. For those who don't, you should know that our department's prosecutors will also be empowered to hold accountable those who do not follow the law. Thank you very much for having me here today, and I'm happy to take a few questions.